Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday here at noon Pacific and 3 p.m. Eastern. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. If you are looking for a therapist, I am proud to be sponsored by BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Chris Godinas. They are an online counseling service. They are international. So whatever country you're in, you can just go on to BetterHelp with a P, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas and just fill out the questions and they will assign you a counselor here in the States. Also, if you are in the United States and you are in a town that is rural and you don't like the counselor and you want to get a counselor in your state, but you don't want to drive three hours, get on to betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P with a P, betterhelp dot com slash Chris Godinas and they will set you up with somebody in your state. All of the counselors are uh, master's level or PhD level and they are all licensed in their states in the state you are in. So there is that betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas. I want to thank them very much for being my sponsor. Thank you guys. Okay. So let's see, what are we talking about today? We got so much to talk about. So hold on. Just want to, uh, okay. Shahida's book. Love, 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 love. Get Shahida's book. She's awesome. She's got uh, suggestions for um, journaling in here. And I love this. And it's called The Highly Sensitive Person's Guide to Dealing with Toxic People. Shahida Araby. She's amazing. And when I get back out on the road and I can get to New York, I am going to see if I can see her and give her a big hug and tell her how awesome she is because she's awesome and I like her. So also Susanna Quintana. You're still that girl. SusannaQuintana.com. She's amazeballs. I love her book. She's awesome. Hopefully, again, she's having a hard time getting the uh, vaccine. So, But once she gets vaccinated, she and I can start talking about, oh, let's do a seminar. That would be fun. That would be great. And, of course, my books are available on uh, ChrisCodinas.com, or you can get them on Amazon.com. So this is uh, What's Wrong With Your Dad, and you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him cha-cha. So those are those books. I also do the audible for those. I read them because... I don't like some of the readers, so I do it myself. And this beautiful mug is available on chriscodinas.com. So, and it's $24.99, $24.99, shipping included. I don't care where you are in the world. Please buy them. Get them out of my hallway. Thank you. All right. So there's that. All right, guys. So this is a big topic today. So we have got, um, we've got gaslighting, lying, pathological lying, and rewriting history. So Whoa. Why do they do that? Well, abusers need to control. So the first time they lie, and we're not even aware of it, is when they meet us. And it is the love bombing phase. And oh, you like pizza? I like pizza. Oh, you like ice cream? I like ice cream. You like to ice skate? I like to ice skate. You like moose? I like moose. So it's just like Princess Anna and Hans from Frozen. So he just lied through his teeth that, oh, you like this? I like that. When in truth, he could care less. So that's the first time they lie to us. And we don't even realize it because they're love bombing, love bombing, love bombing, love bombing, love bombing, love bombing. And they're, um, you know, making us think that they are just like us, you know, like, oh my gosh, we're so similar. We're soulmates. We're twin flames, whatever they're, you know, happy horse doo-doo is. That's what they tell us, right? So that's the first time they lie to us. Then as the discard, the devaluation and the discard starts happening, you're going to start catching them in little white lies. Actually, not white lies. You're going to catch them in lies. Okay. That's why I titled this. If their lips are moving, they're lying. So um, they're going to start lying about anything and everything, even things they don't need to lie about. They're going to start lying. So why? Why? All right. Well, let's talk about lying for a second, shall we? So one of the things that abusers do is they say, oh, well, everybody lies. Okay, well, yeah, everybody does white lies. Like you're not going to be brutally honest and tell somebody that, you know, they don't look good in those jeans. You're going to say, eh, the other ones look better. You know, you're not going to be mean about it. So those are called white lies. Okay. But what abusers engage, engage in are detrimental lies, harmful lies that, that promote themselves that aggrandize themselves or that serve some sort of purpose for them. And it usually is to the detriment of others. Okay. They also lie by omission. So they think that just leaving things out. So for example, they're having an affair 
and they get an STD and they don't tell their partner about it. That's lying by omission. That's kind of important, you know. So they lie by omission. They they lie to aggrandize themselves. They lie to get whatever it is that they are looking for. So, all right, so let's talk about lying. So pathological lying is a compulsive need to lie. And that's what these people do. So it's like, literally, they can't, they don't stop themselves. They could stop themselves. They don't want to. And pathological lying has never been in the DSM-5 because nobody could agree on what constitutes pathological lying. However, there is more emphasis being put on that, which I think is important. I was just reading an article on psychology today. Can't remember who the writer was, but he was basically saying, you know, we've known about this since the beginning of psychology, since the beginning of this field. For 130 years, we've known that there are pathological liars, that there are compulsive liars. And, you know, we need to take a look at this. And here's here's my definition of it. And it was perfect because it was like, you know, it ultimately ends up harming them. It end, ends up harming everybody else. It's for aggrandizement. It's for this. It's for that. And lying is a key component of several personality disorders. Isn't that interesting? So lying is a key component of antisocial personality disorder. That's because the rules do not apply to them. And so they lie and they believe their lie. And they think if they tell their lie enough, everyone else will believe it and it will somehow magically become true. Um, it's also a component of narcissistic personality disorder. It can be a component of borderline personality disorder when they have slid further down the road and they are into that uh, which category. So remember, there's like the um, quiet, um, then the hermit, then the, the queen who's the control freak, and then there's the witch who's just sadistic. So when they've slid, again, kind of like dark triad into that end of it, yes, lying becomes a component of it. So the pathological lying, it, they're looking at developing a separate thing for it because it is a separate thing. That's just, and the funny thing of it is, is the researchers discovered that they, the people who engaged in compulsive or pathological lying did so when they didn't need to, they just did it just to see if they could get away with it. So that's antisocial. That's, that's really, you're getting into psychopathy at that point. So they just did it to see if they could get away with it. And it was a power thing. And it was a, um, it was kind of one of those, you know how when the narcissist pulls a fast one and you can just, you can see them when they're, when they're thinking about it or when they're doing it. Cause it's kind of like, ha 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 ha. I just pulled a fast one on you. Ha, I'm so smart. I'm so this, I'm so that. It's like, Oh my God. So yeah. So it's, it's a power thing for them. It's a control thing for them. It's a, how much can I get away with thing? It's an adrenaline rush. That was the other thing that was in this study on psychology day. And if you want to look this stuff up, Type in pathological lying psychology today. All of these articles will pop up on it. So um, I did pull a couple of them, but um, but it's a it's an adrenaline rush. And one of them tried to say it was an addiction, and they just couldn't help themselves. But yet they were able to stop when it suited their purposes. So like when they were being examined or when they were being in a situation where they couldn't get away with the lie, they were able to stop themselves. So obviously they could stop it. They don't, they don't want to. And, and this goes back to the question, the perennial, the eternal question that I always get, can they get better? No, they, no. With a side of no and an extra helping of no. Kim Saeed just posted this wonderful blog, you know, with a bunch of data on it. Um, go check out her website, Kim Saeed. It's uh, S A E E D Kim Saeed. Um, and it was all about how in the history of ever, no one has ever recovered from narcissism. There is no known cases of somebody who has recovered from this because they don't want to. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but she posted a really great article on this and listed some, some studies and things like that. So um, they don't want to change. They could, if they wanted to stop it, they don't want to. It's really, it's how many light, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but this light bulb has to really want to change. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. They don't want to change. They don't want to get better. So the pathological lying is for their own aggrandizement and they do it because it, it's an adrenaline hit. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to get away with this. Oh, I did. Oh, look at that. You know, that, ooh, that kind of thing. So, um, they lie and they lie to create 
cognitive dissonance. So this is where we now are sliding into the gaslighting. So gaslighting and lying, kind of the same thing. Gaslighting is very specific though. So lying, they just lie about pathological lying. They just lie about everything. And in the article I have on, let me see, understanding compulsive liars. Let me get over there. Uh, Robert Reich, MD of New York City, a psychiatrist and an expert in um, psychopathology says compulsive lying has no official diagnosis. Instead, intentional dissemination, dissimulation, not the kind associated with dementia or brain injury. So like, say for example, somebody's got a brain injury and they can't tell the truth because they don't remember the truth because they've got a brain injury. That's different. Dementia, they're in a different world. They're going into the past. They can't remember the present. They can't remember the uh, short-term memory, that kind of thing. Those are very different things. Um, is associated with a range of diagnoses such as antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. When it comes to compulsive liars, says Charles Ford, a professor of psychiatry at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, words seem to flow out of their mouth without them thinking about it. Ford, the author of Lies, 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 The Psychology of Deceit, says that pathological liars may slide easily from the notion that something could have happened to the conviction that it did. When pressed, many will admit that they, what they are saying is not true. So what is going on here is they are creating their own reality. That's magic thinking. So if I say something often enough, I'm going to believe it. You're going to believe it. But yet they know, they know that it's not true. Interesting, isn't it? So what they use this for is gaslighting. So gaslighting is when the abuser comes in and does something unforgivable and horrible, says something unforgivable and horrible, and then says, you mistook. You didn't hear me right. That's not what I said. I said this when that is totally not what they said. So they will either do that. That's called gaslighting. Okay. And so what is gaslighting? Where, where did this term come from? So the term gaslighting comes from a play that was done in the 1930s. And it was made into a movie with uh, Ingrid Bergman. And she played an heiress and she had some sort of jewels or, or, uh, wealth inheritance and this really bad guy married her for this inheritance and so he would keep searching the house and every time he searched the house the gas lights would dim and do other things because he was using the gas in the upper stories to try to search the attic and the walls and things like that and knocking on the walls and things like that and so when she mentioned something he would you know no there's what are you talking about there's no change in the lights you're crazy how many of us have been called crazy by an abuser oh that's gaslighting so they, that's gaslighting. And the whole movie was all about that. And the beautiful thing is, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, don't listen to this next part. Put your fingers in your ear. The good thing is the bad guy gets it in the end. So that's that makes me very happy. But anyway, in the movie, she thought she was losing her mind because, you know, she loved this guy and she thought he was great. And here's this person that she loved and she cared for and trusted lying to her about the gas, you know, the level of lights in the room. And she really thought she was losing her mind. And thankfully good guys came in and made sure that that didn't happen. So I love Deus Ex Machina stuff. It makes me very happy. So um, anyway, the point being is that gaslighters do it with the intention of altering the target's reality. And they know they're doing it. They know they're doing it. Just like I said earlier. So they come in, they gaslight. No, this happened. No, this happened. It didn't happen the way you're remembering. You're mistaken. You're mistaken. Okay. Yeah. You, you heard me wrong. Oh, you misunderstood. As soon as somebody says I've misunderstood something, I know, I know immediately that they've been lying because here's the deal. People don't usually misunderstand something grand. Does that make sense? I mean, you can have little misunderstandings like, oh wait, I heard you wrong. But if you've got witnesses or you know what they said and they're trying to say you're crazy, oh, you're crazy. You misunderstood me. That's not what I said. Oh, Houston, huge red flag, huge red flag, because that's their stock and trade is as soon as you called them on something, oh, you misunderstood what I said. That's not what I said. I said this. You must have misunderstood me, except that in one conversation, they said the exact same thing three times. Hmm. Misunderstanding? I don't think so. I think y'all are lying. Woo, there you go. So yeah, so that's what they do. They try to march in with the gaslighting, rewriting of history. That is called rewriting history. So you have a conversation with somebody 
and they lie. They say the same thing three times. And okay, are you sure this is the way it's going to be? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh huh. And then when you call them out because you've checked with somebody else and they go, Oh, you misunderstood. That's not what I said. You misunderstood. You're crazy. You're, you need help. You need, he does any of this sound familiar? Cause it sure as hell sounds familiar to me. So yeah. So this is what they do. So they're gaslighting. They're lying intentionally to distort your reality, to distort your sense of self, to distort your sense of reality so that you buy into their reality. And if you resist in any way, shape or form, that's when the insults start. That's, oh, you're crazy. You're this, you're that. You, 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 the you, 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 you guns. That's another really good indication you're dealing with an abuser. So it creates cognitive dissonance. So here, here's, here's reality. Here's what we know. They come in, gaslight, 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 gaslight. And because we love them, we believe them, you know, and we start second guessing ourselves. We stop listening to our gut. Big mistake because that's what they want. They don't want you to listen to your gut. They want you to listen to them. So let me read this on gaslighting. This is also from Psychology Today. Let me see who this is by. This is by Robin Stern, PhD. Let me get down to where I wanted to go. There it is. Okay. How to know if you're being gaslit. If any of the following warning signs ring true, you may be dancing the gaslight tango or dancing with the devil, as I like to say. Um, take care of yourself by taking another look at your relationship, talking to a trusted friend and or trauma therapist. I threw that in and begin to think about changing the dynamic of your relationship. And this goes for let me be very clear. This goes for romantic relationships. This goes for family relationships. How often? Do the abusers in a family, when the kid figures it out, go, yeah, I see the pink elephant taking a dump in the corner of the living room. And then the parent will slap them. No, you don't. You don't. There's nothing there. Our family's 100% normal. That's gaslighting. That is gaslighting. When the kid knows there's something wrong, the father or the mom slaps them and says, no, you don't see anything wrong. This is normal. Every family does that. Oh, that is gaslighting. That's lying. It's gaslighting. It's rewriting history. And it's forcing that kid into believing that dysfunctional family dynamic. So, okay. So it, it, it goes for, it goes for employers. You'll never find another job. Nobody else is going to hire you. I'm the only one that would hire you. Wow. How similar to no one else is going to love you. You'll never find another partner. Ooh, that sounds real familiar and real similar, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. So this goes for bosses, families, friends, siblings, romantic partners, any of this. If, if any of these people are saying this, that is your clue to get the hell out. Like seriously, because they're showing you who they are and you should believe them the first time. Seriously, like don't get me started because yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's get back to the gaslighting. Hang on half a tick. Okay. So if any of these sound really familiar, you are constantly second guessing yourself. Oh, did that really happen to, did that happen the way I thought? Maybe I, maybe I mistook. Maybe I am wrong. Oh God. Oh no, 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 no. You trust your gut. Oh, Andrea, thank you, my love. Um, you trust your gut. You trust your gut. Because they want you to start second guessing. Healthy, normal people don't need to second guess. I mean, we second guess in that we go, am I doing the right thing? Okay, let me let me really take a look at this, do a pro and a con list, make sure I'm doing the right thing. Okay, yeah, I am doing the right thing. Or, ooh, wait, the pro and the con list turned out differently than I thought. Maybe I do need to do something different. But there's not this influence, literally the devil whispering in your ear going, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You know, it's this crazy and crazy thing, crazy making makes us crazy. So second guessing, not being able to trust your gut. Most healthy people are able to have certainty, certainty. They take away our certainty because they can't start. They start everything that they loved us for everything. They love bombed us for in the discard phase suddenly becomes, becomes everything that's heinous. Oh, well you're too this, you're too sensitive. Oh, you're too emotional. I swear to God, you hear those words, you run. Don't walk to the nearest exit. You run. You get the hell away from that person because there is no such thing as too sensitive. There is no such thing as too emotional. Everyone has a right to their perception. Everyone has a right to their emotions. And for this person to march in and go, let me tell you what you need to be feeling. Oh, 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 mother clucker. No, eh. run. Do not walk to the nearest exit. 
Absolutely. Okay, hold on. Continuing on. So sorry, I got sidetracked. Oh, you ask yourself, am I too sensitive? A dozen times a day, because they keep telling us we are too sensitive. You often feel confused and even crazy. I cannot tell you the number of times that people come in. Well, when I used to actually see people in person before COVID, sit on my couch and go, I'm crazy. I feel crazy. I feel crazy. And then we start talking and I'm like, mm hmm you are not the problem. Let's talk, you know, and we figure it out. It's that there's this gaslighting going on. There's this pathological lying going on. So, okay, hold on. Let me go back. Um, you're always apologizing to your abuser. Always apologizing. Always. And I hate this because whew, if you read my book, I think I talk about it. I said sorry for everything. I was always, I'd run into a mannequin and I'd apologize to the damn mannequin because I was like, oh God, I'm so sorry I ran into you. Uh, okay, it's a mannequin. All right. Oops. You know, I mean, we are trained to take responsibility because they won't for everything. And we end up apologizing all the time. I used to do that. And what kills me is when I see kids that are in the middle of a high conflict divorce, constantly apologizing to the abuser. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it's, it's as if the abuser has trained the targets of abuse and the kids to be sorry for even existing. That makes me very angry because they, these people have no right to have children if that's the game they're going to play. And they do. And so that's why it is so important that if you find your child apologizing, apologizing, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, get them into a therapist. Make sure when you do your divorce decree, it's in there that you have say on a therapist and that the children get therapy because believe you me, they're going to need it. If you have not read this book, Splitting by Bill Eddy and Randy Krieger, get it because the kids are going to need therapy. All right. So apologizing for everything. Um, uh, you can't understand why with so many apparently good things in your life, you aren't happy. Do you feel like you are walking on eggshells? Another book by Randy Krieger, by the way, Stop Walking on Eggshells. Are you walking on eggshells? Are you constantly waiting for the next shoe to drop? You know, are you unable to stay in the moment because the abuser won't let you? Because the abuser is either living in future happiness all the time. Well, when we do this, we'll be happy. Well, when we do that, we'll be happy. Or da 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 da, -da. Or, you know, you, 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 you stuff. Or ruining the current moment. That's a common theme with them. You know, how dare you have fun? How dare you feel? How dare you love when I can't? That's their, their thing too. So what they do is they start an argument. They do whatever. So are you not able to enjoy what you have in the here and the now? And if so, you want to take a look at why? And it probably has to do with an abuser. So there is that. Um, okay. Uh, you frequently make excuses for your partner's behavior to friends and family. And if the friends and family do not accept those excuses, unfortunately, when we're in the middle of being in one of those relationships, we tend to run back to the abuser and tell them, well, Aunt Martha suggested that this, that, and the other thing, because we desperately want to hear from the abuser that they're not the abuser. You're going to a well that is not only dry, it's salted and it's poisoned. Stop. Stop. You're not going to get comfort from them. What they will then do is insist that you give up Aunt Martha. That's what they do. They erase family and friends. As soon as the lies are starting to be seen, can't have that. Let's get rid of everybody who sees it. Oh, no, you can't. I don't like Aunt Martha. Aunt Martha doesn't like me. I don't like her. You can't be around her. That's called isolation. So that's a part of the gaslighting techniques. They start making you think that the people that love you the most are in fact the problem when in fact the problem is the abuser and that's gaslighting. So again, they, they flip everything on its head. They take this aunt that you've loved forever or this parent or this sibling or this friend that you've loved forever and start convincing you that they are evil, bad and wrong just because they see them for what they are. And they convince us to isolate ourselves. Oh, I didn't, you didn't, you isolated yourself. You stopped talking to them. Well, yeah, because you basically said I couldn't go see them. You see where I'm going with that? So that is, that is, the, that is the goal of gaslighting. That is the goal of rewriting history. That is the goal of 
of an abuser is to manipulate and control. And this is all about manipulation and control. Um, okay. Uh, you know something is terribly wrong, but you can never quite express it, not even to yourself. So, and that's why I did a couple of, of videos about denial is deadly. Denial is deadly. We know something's wrong, but we're not even willing to admit it to ourselves when we're in the middle of it, you know? And we don't want to investigate it just like we, we don't want to believe that they're the bad guy. So that's when we're in the middle of it. That's when we're in the thick of the abuse. That's when we're in the whole uh, abuse clock. We're probably just coming out of the love bombing phase. We're probably somewhere in the devalue and discard phase. And we just don't want to believe it. We don't want to believe it. We don't want to believe that this wonderful person is not, in fact, this wonderful person. Hang on. Let's go back to this. Um, okay. Uh, ah, this is the worst one. So the abusers want us to be them. They want us to validate what they are doing. So they tell their target of abuse, everybody lies. Well, everybody lies. You should lie too. Everybody lies. It's no big deal. Everybody lies. Then the target of abuse starts lying for two reasons. One, they want to please the abuser. So they start lying because the abuser told them to lie. Or two, they start lying to avoid punishment from the abuser. So they don't tell the truth because they know if they told the abuser the truth that they would get in trouble and there would be a screaming match and they'd never sleep and the abuser would keep them up at night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So <sighs> the abuser's goal is to destroy anything good in the target. Seriously, that's they want us dead. When I say they want us dead, I'm not kidding you. They either want us to commit suicide or they want to kill us themselves or they want to commit soul murder, meaning they take away the moral compass of who we are. And it is replaced with their ability to lie and lie easily. The lies just flow off their tongues and they want us to do the same thing. So that's a soul death because your moral compass is now compromised. So that is common in abusers. Um, all right. Uh, okay. There's that one. Okay. Um, you have trouble making even simple decisions. So here's the thing that abusers do. Like I said, they want to take our certainty from us. So how many of us prior to the relationship were certain? Was, we're happy. We're happy. Go lucky. We're, you know, we knew what we wanted and we, we went out and got it and this, that, and the other thing. We start in on a relationship with an abuser and then all of a sudden we cannot even make a simple decision. Why? Because if we make a decision, they'll make us wrong for it and they take away our joy and they make us wrong for laughing and they make us wrong for being happy and they make us wrong for having a good time and they make us wrong for being outgoing and they make us wrong for all the things that they cannot do because they're jealous. And so when it comes time to make a decision, we're paralyzed because, well, if I do this, they're going to say that. And if I do that, they're going to say this. And, oh gosh, I really want them to approve of me. This is why working on self-esteem and working on the disease to please by Harriet Breaker, self-esteem by Glenn Schraldi, so hugely important. You must get your sense of self back and you must get your boundaries back and you must Stop engaging in people pleasing because it's dangerous. It's dangerous. That's what these people do. So then it comes to the point where we can't even make a simple decision. We're paralyzed. We're par by analysis paralysis. Well, if I do this, they're going to say that. If I do that, they're going to do this. Oh my gosh, what do I do? Okay. So it's, we're not the person we used to be. If you used to be able to make decisions like that, it's going to go away if you're staying in a relationship with that with an abuser. Um, you have a sense that you used to be a very different person, more confident, more fun loving and more relaxed. Oh, I just was talking about that. You feel hopeless and joyless. You feel as though you cannot do anything right. And that is what they do. They put us on this pedestal with the love bombing, love bomb, love bomb, love bomb. Oh, you're perfect. I love you. You're everything's great. And then they take utter joy in knocking that pedestal out from underneath us, watching us fall to the ground. And then they proceed to kick us while we're down. And then they start telling us that all of the things that they said they loved about us, they don't, you know, you're to this, you're to that, you're, you're this, you're that. And they're telling us who they, they're projecting, they're projecting who they are onto us. And unfortunately, a lot of us believe it because we're so in shock from the change from love bombing to the devalue and discard that we're just destroyed. 
you know, and that's why get with a good trauma therapist, get working on these books, CPTSD from surviving to thriving by Pete Walker, disease to please by Harriet Breaker, um, inner child workbook by Catherine Taylor, um, uh, uh, radical acceptance by Tara Brock, a radical forgiveness by Colin tipping. All of these books will help you through this. Once you're out of it, once you're out of it, it is incredibly difficult to heal in an environment where you're being lied to, where you're being gaslit and we're re revisionist history, where history is being re rewritten, rewritten, rewritten. Re I never said that. That never happened. Oh no, you said this. Wait a minute. I never said that. You did. What? That's gaslighting. And that is detrimental to a person's certainty, to their core of who they are. And that's intentional. That's why they're doing it. Okay, back to this. Hang on. Oh, I will get to the questions. I know we're at 1230. Hang on. Um, okay, feels you though you cannot do anything right. And that hurts self-esteem, obviously, and that's what they want. And they want you, they want you in this state of, well, what can I do to please you? What can I do to make this right? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What can I hold on? Nope. If somebody's constantly making you wrong for breathing, for existing, there is nothing you can do to make that right because it's the problem lies with them. But we don't realize that as targets of abuse because we're so wanting them to love us. So that's why it's important to get with a good therapist. As soon as you recognize something's off, start working on self-esteem and you cannot tell your, your, your partner if they're an abuser that you're in therapy because the second you tell them that you're seeing a therapist, they're going to want to come with. They're going to want to know everything that is said in therapy. It's none of their business. They're going to start telling you that the therapist that you're seeing is incompetent and a liar and this, that, and the other thing because they see you changing and not taking their BS. So, yeah, that's something to think about. Okay. Uh, where am I? Uh, where am I? Uh, you feel so you can't do anything right. You wonder if you are a good enough person, good enough employee, good enough friend, good enough spouse, good enough sibling, good enough. Yeah, because they keep telling you you're not. So gaslighting is intentional. Lying is intentional. The pathologicalness of it is intentional. They enjoy it. Again, it's part of the the endorphins, the dopamine, the serotonins, the norepinephrines, the, you know, adrenaline, you know, can they get away with it? Can I make this person believe this? Can I force them to believe my worldview? Can I believe, you know, that whole thing? Whew. So it is very de detrimental to the target of abuse because again, the change from I love you, I love you, I love you to I hate you, you're wrong, you're you're too sensitive, you're this, you need help, you're crazy, blah, 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 is so radical. It's literally like your head spins. And it is detrimental because we loved them and we want their love. We want that love bombing back. But the reality of it is, in the beginning, they were lying to us. They didn't care about any of the things we cared about. They didn't like any of the things we liked. They were mirroring us back to us. And this person was an illusion. The person we thought we knew simply did not exist. And there's nothing to get back to because it did not exist. And they cannot maintain the mask forever. They just can't. They won't. And they can't. So are they lying on purpose? You bet your bippy they are. Absolutely. Are they doing it to harm you? Yes, they are. The reason being they want to control, they want to manipulate, and they want to create their own reality. And they won't change. They and they won't respond if you try to call them out on it. I had somebody say, "Well, but you know, don't you get your backbone back when you call them out on it?" What's going to happen is they're going to gaslight harder and they're going to abuse harder. Get away from them. You cannot help them. You cannot fix them because you did not break them. The only person that can help or fix them is themselves, and they ain't going to do it. So, all right. So that is gaslighting. Uh, pathological lying, which is not in the DSM-5 yet. I am hoping that it is going to be. It's so funny because they were like, well, we can't come up with a definite definition. And I'm like, ask anybody who survived abuse. They'll give you a definite definition. Duh. Um, so there's that. Um, so gaslighting, lying, rewriting history. It is all for control, manipulation, creating the reality that the abuser wants, you know, creating cognitive dissonance where your reality is now hijacked and you cannot come back to center so that your sense of certainty is gone so that you're more easily manipulated. That is why they do this. And it is absolutely 110% intentional. Don't kid yourself that it's not. 
because it is. Okay, let's hit the questions. Dun, dun, dun. Where am I? Okay. Uh, my boyfriend was in a toxic relationship with his narcissistic mom and has trouble staying honest if he thinks he will get in trouble. This is common with kids coming out of an abusive relationship. Absolutely. Hang on. Remember, please, please, it's a learned behavior. So when we're used to getting in trouble with somebody, we hide things or we don't tell the truth because we don't want to get in trouble again. So, um, if he thinks, okay, how can I help him feel safe enough to open up? You're going to have to suggest therapy. The, the only way to get rid of fleas is you got to go through and squish them. And that means you got to deal with the family of origin stuff. You've got to deal with this original wound over here that created all the fleas over here. Does that make sense? So I would have a serious conversation if he's open to it uh, about getting into some trauma therapy and working on this and reading the books and really being meticulous in his word because that's going to destroy your relationship. You know, once the trust is gone, it's incredibly hard to get back. So it would be it would behoove him to go get some personal work done. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, why do abusers have difficulty accepting that they've done abuse? Ego. They are all ego. There is no there there. So if you watch the video I did a couple of weeks ago on why don't they get help? Why don't they change? It's all ego. There is no there there. If it's traits of, if like they've got some, you know, fleas, basically, a therapist can work with them because there's enough space in there to get through the ego to help them. But with a full blown, all the way down, you know, middle or down spectrum, they're so invested in their worldview and they're so invested in being right and they're so invested in their ego that there's no space to get in there and work on anything they refuse refuse to admit they've ever done anything wrong you know my dad used to say something similar to that you know i've never done done anything wrong in my life and i'm sitting here going <laughs> you know, I, yeah, he did a lot wrong. So, you know, or I'm never, I'm never lost. I'm only temporary, conf temporarily confused. He would say that when we're on like a, a road trip and we're out in the middle of the forest and the car is high centered on a rock and I'm sitting here going, we're going to die. Great. We're going to die. You know, I mean, so they say things like that because their ego cannot handle them being wrong. Here's a great example. Another one from my dad. We were driving the van. We had an old Ford van and it had uh, cruise control. So we're going down the road and the cruise control suddenly went crazy. It wouldn't, it wouldn't disengage. So he would put on the brake. It wouldn't disengage. He would turn it off. It wouldn't disengage. And the car is gaining speed and going faster and faster. And he was panicking and my mom was panicking. And I finally looked over. I was 10 years old at the time. And I finally looked over them and I said, turn the car, put it in neutral, turn the car off, <laughs> which I, I will attribute that one to my to my guardian angels because how would a 10 year old know that? So, you know, he was, you know, no, no, you're wrong. What do you know about it? You're just a kid, blah, blah, blah. And finally, my mother screamed at him, just do what she says. He did it. It disengaged. We were fine. So, of course, you know, he was angry the whole way because he didn't find the solution and because I did. And of course, I got punished for that later on. But, you know, I mean, so that's that's kind of an example of how invested they are in always being right and that they'll never admit that there's a problem, even when it's like hurtling down the road at 95 miles an hour. You know what I'm saying? So they just don't. There, There is. There is just so much ego there. They won't ever admit that they've ever done anything wrong. And this heartbreaking thing of it is is that even when an abuser, and this has been reported to me by multiple Department of Children's Service people, an abuser will be sitting there beating the kid, and at the same time they're beating the kid, this isn't happening, I'm not doing it, you're not getting hit, you, you know, gaslighting as the event is happening. So it just makes me sick to my stomach. So that's why they don't accept that they're doing anything wrong. Their egos are so huge that they are unwilling to see the truth. They are unwilling to take accountability. They are unwilling to do anything different. So I hope that answered the question. Um, because healthy, normal people are willing to go, what's my part? What have I done? What can I do differently? You know, they're introspective. They're, it's kind of like, what can I do differently? What can I do better? Have I harmed somebody? Do I need to make amends? Okay, I will make amends. Okay, good. I did make amends. Okay, I forgive myself and I move on. You know, that's a healthy, normal person. 
A narcissist will never make amends. And if they do, it's fake. You know, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That didn't sound like a real apology, did it? You know, or I'm sorry. And then they do the very same behavior over again, which says clearly they're not sorry because actions speak louder than words. If somebody is constantly going, I'm sorry, and then doing the same thing over again, they're not sorry. A real apology is I hurt you. I acknowledge that I hurt you. I own that I hurt you. I am mortified. It will not happen again. Please forgive me. That is a true apology. And then the action never happens again. Amends have been made. You do what you need to to repair the relationship. And that action never happens again. Narcissists will never do that. Not on this or any other planet. So there's that. Okay, where am I? Best way to tackle a really long goodbye letter without it turning into a mini novel. It's about six years worth of things to cover. Turn it into a mini novel. That's perfectly okay. There is no wrong way to do a goodbye letter. And you might just decide to publish. <laughs> you know? So there's really no wrong way to do it. And if there's six years worth to cover, then write. Take it in sections. Take it. That's how do you think this came about? This came about by me taking in sections, you know, little kid to about seven or eight years old, seven or eight years old to preteen, preteen to teen, teen to adult, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So do it write as long as you need to. There's no wrong way to do that. And if it turns into a mini novel, okay, you might want to consider publishing. Change all the names, make sure that you don't get sued. But do you see where I'm going with that? So yeah, there's no wrong way to do that. It's okay. It doesn't matter. So like when my dad died, I had to write him a goodbye letter and it was probably close to 30 pages long. And I just, you know, let him have it. It was very emotional. And it was, it took me several months to complete. This is not like a quick, oh, let me just jot this all down and we're done. This is like, let me dive into this and let me really work through this so that I don't have to keep dealing with this. So, um, you know, it was probably about 30 pages and that was the goodbye letter to him. And I just let him have it, you know, and I said everything I needed to say. And I didn't burn that one because I turned it into a book. So, <laughs> you know, it's whatever makes you comfortable, you know, turn it into a book, shred it, burn it, whatever makes you mail it back to yourself, then shred it, mail it back to yourself, then burn it, whatever makes you comfortable. So it doesn't matter how long it is. Let it be long. If, if it needs to be long, let it be long. That's it. It is what it is. Does that make sense? Don't make yourself wrong for that. Okay. Um, and like I said, at the end of it, you may consider publishing to help other people. Um, because I think a lot of things that survivors of abuse don't understand is that it's okay to get angry at your abuser, especially if it was a parent. Because how much, how much, oh, honor thy mother and father. Oh, you can't get mad at the parent. They're the parent. They gave birth to you. Okay. And then they abused you for the next, you know, however many years that doesn't make it right. You have the right to be angry. That's called righteous anger. So it's what we do with the anger that makes it helpful or hurtful. So getting it out of your head onto paper, expressing it, working through it, getting it out, dealing with the original wound, getting with a good trauma therapist, working CPTSD from surviving to thriving by Pete Walker would be a really good idea. <laughs> so, sorry. That was a huge run on sentence. So, um, yeah. So, there it is. Okay. Uh, my question is about how to hold firm boundaries when you're trying to set up new healthiness. When I've been trying to do this with cousins, I have misplaced guilt and feel bad about myself. Okay. That is codependency. And that is going to be the topic of next week's show. I want to talk about the difference between helping and codependency because there seems to be some confusion on that. So I want to talk more about that. Um, so codependency is where we feel guilty when we say no, when we draw boundaries. So any relationship, let me just say this again, any relationship that makes you feel fearful, obligated, or guilty is not a healthy relationship. So in any relationship, you're going to want to talk about deal breakers. What will you not put up with from anybody? So that should be no disrespect. Absolutely. No, not respecting your boundaries. If they don't respect your boundaries, be done. Uh, name calling. You're not going to put up with name calling. You're not going to put up with lying. You're not going to put up with gaslighting. You're not going to put up with rewriting history. You're not going to put up with cheating. You're not going to put up with, you know, come up with your own. So those are just kind of the basic ones. 
So when you hold firm boundaries with cousins and you're feeling guilty, it would be good to kind of work through this. Where is this coming from? Why are you feeling guilty for saying no? You know, is somebody making you wrong for not being a caregiver? And who is that? Who is making you wrong for not being a caregiver and for having good boundaries? So get with a good trauma therapist, work those books, uh, Codependent No More, Beyond Codependent No More by Melanie Beatty, The Disease to Please by Harriet Breaker. Figure out where this is coming from. Whose voice is that? And then as soon as you figure out whose voice that is, write them a goodbye letter. Dear, I don't know, uh, Aunt Bertha. You know, I don't need to feel guilty for having boundaries. In fact, boundaries are necessary for healthy relationships. Thank you for trying to do a guilt trip on me and control me. Go pound sand, love me, then trot it out to the barbecue, read it out loud once, burn it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question, I escaped my narc and had no contact for ages, but he slowly reappeared. Ooh, that's scary. Even though I can see it and know it, I'm letting him in my life. Why am I being so stupid? Sweetie, first of all, stop calling yourself stupid. You're not stupid. This is what happens to us. So hold on a second. How old do you feel when you're wanting him back in your life? How old are you? Inner Child Workbook, Catherine Taylor, CPTSD, From Surviving to Thriving, Pete Walker, do a list of every rotten thing this person has ever done to you and then block them. Block them. Block them, block them, block them. So we let them back in our life on average seven times. I know, it sucks. So if you look at the statistics of domestic violence, on average, it takes about seven times of having this person come into our life, go out of our life, we leave, they leave, we come back, they come back, whatever, before it finally sinks in that they are not going to change ever. So it takes seven times to get that. So you're not stupid. It's just that there is some resistance to accepting and acknowledging this person is abusive. They're not good for you. They're toxic. So what is that? How old are you? What's going on? Who does this person remind you of in your family of origin? Who are you trying to amend with? Who are you trying to fix that relationship with? Because remember, inner children, if we come from toxic families, so here's the original wound, right? What the inner child will do is it will look at this and go, oh, I had a horrible relationship with this parent or that parent or that grandparent or whatever. And the in little kid, the inner child will look outside and go, oh, I know. Here's somebody who kind of sort of reminds me of them. If I can make them love me, I prove these guys wrong. Half of a doo-doo sandwich, half of a doo-doo sandwich, <clears throat> total doo-doo sandwich. You don't want that. So I would strongly suggest you work on self-esteem. You are not stupid. I don't want to hear that coming out of your mouth ever again. Mm -hmm. You are not stupid, hon. This is what we do. It's being driven by the inner child. So figure out what's going on with the inner child. Figure out how old you are. You know, what age is trying to get this person back into your life? You know, what, what age doesn't want to believe all the stuff that you as, as the adult know you went through? That's what I'm saying. Do a list of every rotten thing they ever did and reread it daily. You know what I'm saying? So um, get with a good trauma therapist, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker, Inner Child Workbook by Katherine Taylor, The Disease to Please, Harriet Breaker, uh, and start working this stuff because there it's going to, when we get back with the abuser, what, what statistically happens is that the abuse, the love bombing cycle gets shortened every single time. So let's say the first time it was like this, the second time it's like this, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, seventh time, right? And the abuse cycle, the devalue and the discard gets longer and longer and longer and longer. So it, it, the abuse will be ramped up and they'll punish you. For, if you were the one that left, they'll punish you for it. So there that is. Be careful. Get with a good trauma therapist. Um, I could see a friend being isolated from me because I saw through her husband. She's still with him, but talking to me again. How can I get over the hurt of knowing she believed awful things of me? Get with a good therapist, work it through, you know, and, and here's the thing. If she's still with him, it's probably going to happen again, especially if she's opening up to you and talking about things that are going on. Or even if you start saying, hey, why were you willing to believe this of me? She'll run back to the spouse and tell them everything. That is typically what happens. So um, 
just know that if she's still with the abuser, it's going to happen again, especially if, if you call her on that stuff. So you've got to decide, is this relationship toxic? Is this relationship something that you can hang with? Or is this a relationship that you need to let go of? You cannot fix everybody. And sometimes we have to let go of the toxic people, even though we can see what's going on. And this is going to be something I'm going to be talking about next week. Even though we can see what's going on, if the target of abuse does not want help, you cannot help them because what they will do is they will take everything that's truthful that you said, run back to the abuser, tell the abuser, the abuser will fill their head full of lies, and then they'll start hating you because you are the safer target. Let me say that again. When somebody who's been abused starts taking it out on the family and the friends that actually love them, it's because the family and the friends are the safer target. They can't take it out on the abuser. So what they end up doing is they put it onto the family and the friends because the family and the friends love them and they're the safer target. They won't punish them. They won't hurt them. They won't you know, harm them. They won't abuse them, et cetera. So that's, that's part of that isolation and getting rid of anybody who can see the truth kind of thing. Oh, Carol, thank you. Um, okay, so where was I? Um, so yeah, just, just recognize it's probably going to happen again. I would get with a good therapist. I would start working on boundaries. And if and when you do confront her or talk to her about that, you're going to have to realize she's probably going to run back to the spouse and it's probably going to happen all over again. So is it worth it? Is it worth it? And in some cases, you got to disconnect completely, you know, because otherwise they're just going to keep dragging you through this drama and you don't need it. So, um, okay. Do narcissists enjoy gaslighting? Yes. And do they believe the victim caused this themselves? Yes. <laughs> you made me. You made me lie to you. You made me hit you. You made me. How many times have we heard that? A lot. You know, you made me do this. You made me so angry I had to. You did. You, 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 you. They do not take personal responsibility for a damn thing. They don't. They can't. They won't. And it's more a matter of won't. You know, um, they do enjoy it. They absolutely, again, when you get down to the dark triad, so you're talking psychopathy, psychopath, narcissist, and Machiavellianism. So Machiavelli, Machiavelli is the, uh, the prince. Um, so it's a book by Machiavelli, the prince, and it's all about despotism. So yeah, how to be, how to be a despot, you know? So um, they're control freaks and they enjoy the, the chess game. They enjoy, can I make this person kill themselves? Seriously. Like some people are like, oh, you're being dramatic. And I'm like, am I? Because they do things to get the person to kill themselves. They do. They either destroy their self-esteem and take away all their family and friends and fill their heads with so much despair that the victim of abuse, the target of abuse sees no other way out. And then when the person does commit suicide, they're gleeful. They're gleeful about it. They, they mourn, mourn while the funeral is going on and they'll be involved before the body is buried. Um, that kind of thing. So yeah, they are absolutely psychopathic. They're absolutely intentional. They are absolutely, they absolutely love it. Can I make this person kill themselves? Can I make this person harm themselves? Can I make this person believe my reality? Can I make this person give up their family? That's a big one. Can I make them self-isolate? Can I make them do, it's a huge ego trip for them. Huge. Look at how powerful I am. That's, that's their whole thing. They think they're all powerful. They think they're smarter than everybody else. And they think they know better than everybody else. And it gives them great joy to be able to manipulate the pieces on the chessboard. That's the antisocial part of it. So yeah, they're dangerous. Absolutely. They're sadistic. I think I've talked about this before. They're absolute sadists. They absolutely enjoy what they're doing and they absolutely firmly in their head believe that the target of abuse deserves it. How dare you love me? They can't handle real emotion. That's why they have to manipulate and control. And they are angry as hell at the person who actually loves them because they know they don't deserve it. They know it. And so they get pissed off at the person who loves them. How dare you love me? And they're going to punish you for it. This is a no-win situation, guys. There is This is the Kobayashi Maru. Okay? I just totally geeked myself out on that one. So Kobayashi Maru is a, is a no-win situation in Star Trek. So this is the Kobayashi Maru. It's a no-win situation unless you cheat. 
you know, and there's no cheating in this because what can you do to cheat? The only thing that would help is if literally the deus ex machina came down, hit the, the narcissist over the head with an enlightenment stick, and suddenly they understood everything that ever happened to them. But even if that happened, their ego is so great that they would grab that enlightenment stick and probably try to beat up the God that tried to save them. So, you know, it's just, it's not going to happen. They don't change. There's, there's no way to win this one. It is a Kobayashi Maru. There's no way to win. There is no way to win. So, um, okay. I think, oh no, there's more questions. Uh, I have CPTSD. What is the diagnosis that they would use to prescribe medication? I know I have CPD but my narc mom is convinced I am schizophrenic and is telling everyone. So the best thing to do would be to go get a psych eval. You know, go to get a psych eval, get a clear diagnosis. Um, the meds that they use for PTSD are generally anti-anxiety meds or antidepressant meds. Um, I do not recommend them unless you absolutely have to be on them. Psych meds are not to be taken lightly. And it drives me crazy when I have people come in and they're like, do you prescribe? And I'm like, no, I do talk therapy. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I have this going on and that going on. And I just, I just want it to go away. I want a magic bullet. Well, there is no magic bullet. And every single psych med has got pretty heavy hitting side effects. So a lot of them cause impotence. A lot of them cause weight gain, loss of interest in sex for females as well. Um, they can cause hair loss. They can, cause, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes along with that. I only recommend those and send them out to psychiatrists. If it's an absolute last line of defense, talk therapy is not working. It's obviously a brain chemistry issue. Okay. Now we need to look at psych meds. So um, I would not recommend getting on meds unless you had to, I would get with a good therapist. I'd get a definite diagnosis. I would, um, it, you know, start, start working PTSD, CPTSD from surviving and thriving by Pete Walker. And there's a whole bunch of PTSD books out there that are, are really good as well. Um, so one of the things that we find with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is anger. So there's a lot of short tempered. So there's a great uh, Zen book called there's a cow in the parking lot. Cannot think of who wrote that one, but it's called the cow. There's a cow in the parking. There's the, the cow in the parking lot, or there's the cow in the park, or there's a cow in the parking lot. So it's a Zen uh, approach to anger. And, you know, again, it, it deals with a lot of where did this come from? Where did I learn this from? Who's who in my family was angry all the time? Why am I angry? What's happening? What's the payoff? Where am I getting this? So um, yeah, now schizophrenia, again, would need to be an actual diagnosis as would any psychological issue. It would need to be an actual psych eval done to see if you have PTSD, to see if you have schizophrenia, to see if you have bipolar, if you see if you have borderline, to see if you're... So you want to just go get a psych eval done and then you'll know for sure. So there that is. Whew. Okay, let's see if there are any more. I think that's it. Okay, so next week we are going to discuss the difference between being helpful and being codependent. So uh, I think a lot of people have got a lot of confusion on that. And where is the line? Where is the boundary? So we're going to talk about codependency versus um, being helpful. So that's what we're going to talk about. All right, kids, you guys have a great week. Take good care of yourselves. Um, don't forget, uh, if you are looking for a therapist, betterhelp.com slash Chris Godinas, and it should be down in the description. All right. Have a great week, guys. I will talk to you. Where did my cursor go? There it is. All right. I will talk to you next week. Bye.